Great. Um, before getting started, I'd like to provide you a bit of information about our speakers. Um, Brie DiGimarino is the Senior Director of Social Innovation at Indiegogo. Since joining Indiegogo in 2012, Brie built the first operational infrastructure for the company's vertical team and led the development and launch of the company's dedicated cause site. Today, Brie raises awareness around the value of crowdfunding for social impact and works to empower many of the most impactful fundraisers on the site. Some examples of that includes the Blogger for Humans of New York fundraiser um, to address bonded labor in Pakistan with a $2.3 million fundraiser and $76,000 donations. I'm sorry, and 76,000 donations and the hundreds of fundraisers to provide relief in Nepal after the 2015 earthquakes. Uh, before Indiegogo, Brie was the senior associate at the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, a social venture fund, and a, an associate consultant at the Bridgespan Group, the nonprofit arm of Bain & Company. Brie holds a Master of Public Administration in Nonprofit Management from the NYU Wagner School of Public Service and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and Government from the University of Virginia. Um, also on the call today is Emily Drecke. Um, she's graciously agreed to share Chicago Foundation for Women's Experience using crowdfunding for Giving Tuesday. Um, a little bit about Emily. Uh, she's the Vice President of Development and Communications at Chicago Foundation for Women. Emily is responsible for growing the resources and public profile of the foundation and has awarded over 3,500 grants, totaling over $31 million to organizations advancing basic rights and equal opportunities for Chicago area women and girls. Before joining Chicago Foundation for Women six years ago, Emily served as the Assistant Director of Alumni Relations and Annual Giving at the University of Chicago, where she developed fundraising campaigns to increase annual fund support for the university. Emily received her BA with top honors in political science and French from University of Wisconsin-Madison and has recently completed executive in, uh, education in nonprofit finance at the Kellogg School of Management and coursework um, at the Harvard Kennedy School Executive Education. So with that, I'm going to um, turn this over to our, um, our speaker, to Bree, um, and she's gonna kick us off. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, we can hear you. Perfect. Well, thank you for having me today, and Emily, I'm so thankful you could join. It's a treat to be here. I have worked with many organizations to do crowdfunding and have found that this time of year and Giving Tuesday is a really special time to raise funds for impact, so I am thrilled to be sharing the experiences I've had with you, uh, particularly at this time of year um, as we head into Giving Tuesday. So let us do that. Um, Indiegogo, just to tell you real quick, was founded uh, back about 10 years ago now to empower people to fund what matters to them and come together around their ideas, rallying their closest network and then greater networks of people to support them. Since we were founded, we have had a tremendous growth at Indiegogo. We now have campaign owners and contributors in 190 countries around the world with campaigns for a huge variety of projects. It's everything from creative to cause to entrepreneurial and uh, we have now built a big community of supporters for those campaigners. So we have millions of people on our email list and hundreds of thousands of people who we reach uh, via social media. Now I've always worked in our impact space, so I came on in 2012 to support our campaigners in the nonprofit space, as well as individuals and social entrepreneurs who wanted to change the world. So since then I've had the chance to learn a lot about what makes a great campaign in that space. Um, we actually, as um, was mentioned, launched a dedicated site for social impact a few years ago. This is called Generosity. It's at generosity.com. It's a beautiful, elegant site to launch a very quick campaign. It's very simple to get a campaign launched on that site. You can do it in just a matter of minutes and a matter of uh, a few clicks. So that site is a great option. One of the nice things about Generosity is that it has no required fee. So instead, when you donate to a fundraiser on Generosity, you are encouraged encouraged as a backer to leave a gift for generosity, but you can always opt out of it. So uh, especially if you're looking for a model where the fundraising is as um, least costly, then generosity is a fantastic site. It will only have the payment processing fees of 3% and 30 cents per donation, which has become pretty standard in the space. That said, it doesn't have a lot of the advanced features that I find more of our organizational and advanced campaign owners want. So I'm going to dedicate the uh, conversation on this 
uh, session to Indiegogo because those ha that site has all of the features and tools that I find help campaigners raise more significant amounts of funds and run more advanced campaigns. So I wanted to let you know about Generosity. It's an option. It's a great site. You're welcome to use it. Um, but I'm going to focus today on Indiegogo. Indiegogo um, it has really been a great site for um, impact fundraising and uh, we have always kept our dedication to being very supportive of our campaigners so we do a lot of educational sessions like this one and also work hand in hand with campaigners to make sure that they have the resources they need in order to be successful so we like to talk with campaigners far before they launch their campaign so we can give them the most thoughtful uh, help as they prepare to launch since it's that preparation time that is so key to a successful campaign. Um, we also are, as I mentioned, extremely global, so we have that really nice global reach so we can help you to get the word out. Um, once your campaign gets momentum, we share it with ours and really start to um, activate that momentum. And we also have a lot of advanced tools that are unusual in the space. So we've really uh, supported our campaigners by building out features that help them to run very successful campaigns. We'll talk through some of those features today. It's things like having um, secret perks, secret donation levels that you can send to segments of your community, the chance to run a referral contest to activate um, your community to share your campaign, and many, many more um, special features that we have developed through our uh, constant testing to see what helps campaigners to run the best campaigns. So all that said, that's a little background on Indiegogo and uh, where we have come from. What have I found is important for nonprofit campaigners? Well, there's a lot of value you get from a campaign, and that's what you're seeing on this page. A lot of people think of crowdfunding and think about the fund part, and of course, raising funds is a very important part of a campaign, and every campaign has that fundraising aspect at its heart and at its center, and that's important to remember as you run your campaign because focusing on the fundraising will help you to get the word out. But what we find is that the value goes far beyond just the dollars. It's a great way to engage your community, the social, integrations on the pages are uh, really optimized to help you get your community involved and um, sharing the campaign for you and feeling like they're a part of it so it's a great way to engage your existing community as well as then reach out to their networks to source new donors and ultimately reach even wider networks um, sometimes if you are able to get press or to rise up on the Indiegogo sharing um, you start to find that you get even third degree and further um, donors involved so great way to build and engage your donors. Raising dollars, of course, is a key part. I love the point of spreading awareness. A campaign is a great way for you to share your perspective. You can share your thoughts on an issue area. Why is it a challenge? What are some of the root causes? What do you believe will help? And also share what you're doing to address it. So what is your approach and why do you believe it works? And what can others do to help you in that work? Of course, ultimately, all of this is to enable impact so that you are able to do more of what you want to do and uh, change the world. And it also is a great way to learn from your community. So you can find during a campaign that the uh, information you're gathering from your uh, network is, is actually extremely valuable. You can figure out uh, things like what dollar amounts are people willing to give and which kinds of um, messaging is working with different donor groups. Where are your donors coming from? What, what kind of uh, way are you reaching them? Is it via Facebook? Is it via um, other social media networks? What kind of um, referral contests are exciting them? Are they claiming any kinds of perk? Do you really need swag as a perk or are people mostly just giving for the impact? So a lot of kinds of lessons you can learn and I'm very excited for Emily to join us because I think her experience really um, goes and, and shows the gamut here of how you can get value um, by doing a campaign or initiative. So um, I'm going to share a couple examples from Indiegogo before I hand it over to Emily to share with you uh, their really rich experience. Um, a couple of ones before that. So Girl Scouts is for every girl. This is a great example of an organization using crowdfunding at exactly the right time. The Girl Scouts of Western Washington had a donor who committed $100,000 to their programming but then rescinded the gift upon hearing that the organization supported girls who are transgender. The uh, organization wanted to keep their programming as it was and believed strongly in the fact that they wanted to support girls who are transgender so they did give that $100,000 back to the donor but then needed to cover those lost uh, funds. So they turned to Indiegogo. It was at a time when when 
um, there was legislation at the federal level happening in the transgender space, so it was a topic that was really uh, prominent for many people, and that helped them when they launched to very quickly get momentum actually in the press. So for this particular campaign, they got press very early on and uh, ultimately, as you can see on the page, raised more than three times the 100K they needed in order to continue to provide their programming. So it was a huge success for them and um, greatly increased their number of uh, new donors as well. This campaign is a really neat example of how you can use Indiegogo to not only raise money but also to, to spread a message. So the campaign itself is to put up a billboard with it says, I look like an engineer to show that engineers are not just men behind their computers but there are a lot of women with divor diverse voices who are engineers. So this campaign ran in order to raise the funds to put up the billboard. Certainly the billboard itself would share this very important message and also the campaign um, was a way to get the message across too. So so the campaign ended up having a very similar raising awareness effect and they ultimately um, again raised more than their goal from um, many more donors than uh, they had ever started with and they have gone on to have successful work in this space um, after this campaign. This example I wanted to share with you because it's a really neat way that a donor shared and amplified a gift to an organization. So this was an individual donor, but certainly it could be a foundation donor who wants to amplify their gift. I know in the past you used to always hear that people could give their time, talent, and treasure to uh, organizations and impact. I would say in today's world there's the ability to also donate uh, your network. So there's the chance to rally your community for uh, somebody organization you believe in. This particular case, Bill Draper, a well-known venture capitalist in the Bay Area, was giving $100,000 every year to the Parkinson's Institute in uh, the Bay Area to work to help them with their work in care and treatment of people with Parkinson's. His wife has Parkinson's and he uh, very much believes in the work of the Institute. This year he put his $100,000 to the Institute via a campaign on Indiegogo so that he used it as a match and said, uh, you know, once we raise 100,000, I'm giving 100,000 and um, we will do this together. So the idea here was to use that matching incentive through the campaign, which uh, actually very quickly worked and they raised that $100,000 very fast onto the site. So then actually they had a second donor come in and share that they would also match $100,000. Um, this was another, uh, actually I believe it was a board member of the institute. So they had two of their closest community members put their voices to the campaign and that really helped it expand. Now another interesting facet here was that the institute was particularly interested in expanding their reach across generations. So you see they're saying we're in this together and then on the right hand side you can actually see the videos that were released over the course of the campaign. Bill Draper made a video and released that at the very beginning talking about what it was like to have a wife with Parkinson's. It was a very moving uh, video that he shared and uh, that kicked off the fundraiser. Then different members of his family, his son, his daughter, his granddaughter also made videos which were released every uh, week or so over the course of the campaign and each time it was released that generation um, was activated by having that family member share with their community and ultimately the campaign was able to reach multiple generations, raise uh, hundreds of uh, backers, many of whom were new to the Institute. They actually did a campaign again another year and, and again raised uh, more than 500000 for the Institute. So this is a great model to think about and highlights that you need to get your closest community members engaged in your campaign in order for it to be successful because they lend that credibility and uh, that network that can really help your campaign get to uh, larger audiences. Finally, I just wanted to share this example because I know that many people on the call may be working with a portfolio of grantees and one question might be, can I raise funds as a foundation that I then give out to grantees? Um, I've talked so far largely about campaigns that are going and supporting directly a nonprofit. Now, I think there's something easier about raising funds for a specific nonprofit because it's a bit more tangible and very uh, clear for the backers, so they like to know where their dollars go and the clear clear story of funds going to a specific nonprofit, especially if the nonprofit can share what they will do with the funds, is very powerful. That said, I wanted to share this example because we have seen certainly many times when an organizing organization raises funds and then they disperse them. In this case, 
uh, Eric Schwartz, who you might know as the founder of Citizen Schools, ran a campaign to launch the College for Social Innovation. They wanted to fund uh, service year fellows, so they used this campaign to fund multiple fellows. And in a similar way, you could raise funds to support multiple organizations. Now, uh, again, the more specific you can, you can be about who those organizations are uh, and maybe showcase one a week to give people a sense and a deep engagement with that organization on their featured week and have them share on that week, things like that um, can work. And as if you're interested in doing something like that, I'm happy to brainstorm with you. You're, you're always welcome to reach out to me at Bree at Indiegogo.com. Um, but I wanted to show you it's definitely possible, as this campaign showed, by uh, raising more than 50K for uh, multiple uh, service year fellows. So with that, I will um, hand it over to Emily, who has a really innovative example of how to use crowdfunding for um, your foundation. Thanks so much, Bree. Can everyone hear me? I think so, yep. Okay, great. Um, and thanks so much, Women's Funding Network, for inviting me to share a little bit more about Chicago Foundation for Women's Experience with our version of crowdfunding. Um, perhaps like many of you, we've only begun to really dip our toes into this strategy, and we're really grateful for this webinar for an opportunity to not only share, but to also learn. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we did, um, and I'm sure later on there'll be an opportunity if you have questions for me to answer them. But so last year, leading up to Giving Tuesday, uh, we at CFW wanted to do something a little different. And position CFW, which as I'm sure everyone on the phone is aware, a community foundation that raises money for women and girls to give it away for the most part and position us in a strong place to really stand out on a day where there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of other fundraising efforts going on and many things can get lost in the shuffle. So I'm sure as you can relate, sometimes online giving best practices and strategies don't exactly work when you're fundraising for a unique and complex and important organization like a women's fund. Um, but I had experience personally supporting crowdfunding campaigns that my friends had done, um, and I was thinking that and suspected that there was a way to leverage the strategy for our needs at CFW, so we decided to give it a try. Um, so leading up to Giving Tuesday, we sent out to nonprofit organizations throughout the region um, a request for videos. So instead of an RFP, it was an RFV. Uh, we asked organizations that were interested to receive a special $10,000 grant from CFW in honor of Giving Tuesday specifically to improve the lives of women and girls of color in Chicago to send us a one to two minute video that really just at, answered one question, which was what specifically would a special $10,000 grant from CFW this Giving Tuesday help you or your program achieve to improve the lives of women and girls of color in Chicago. We put some stipulations around this, of course, they had to adhere to our guiding principles, things such as um, support for reproductive justice, um, disability rights, uh, LGBTQ rights, things of that nature. Um, we thought, oh, and then we also said that we would prefer not to have, or we did not want to receive proposals from grantees that had recently received funding from CFW so that we can help to uncover new and emerging organizations or perhaps provide another avenue for organizations that haven't yet um, been part of our grantee community to um, get involved with us. And we thought we would maybe get 15 to 20 submissions total. Uh, we wound up getting nearly 70. Um, and so what we did is recruited a task force of volunteers, which included board members, staff members, community leaders, grantees, giving circle members, et cetera, and their task was to help us sort through all these wonderful videos, and they were really great, um, to find uh, three finalists. Um, these individuals also wound up serving as ambassadors later on to share news about the campaign and donate. Um, at the same time, we lined up a matching gift challenge, so all of Chicago Foundation for Women's staff and a good amount of our board members pledged to match donations leading up to an on Giving Tuesday, up to $12,000. And once all that was set, we launched uh, kind of what would be called the public phase. So it was a social media and email campaign that allowed the CFW community to go online to our website, 
and directly participate in an online grant contest where participants who made a gift of any size to CSW leading up to an On Giving Tuesday had the opportunity to view the three finalist videos and essentially vote for one of the three um, programs to receive a special $10,000 Giving Tuesday award. But we also had, um, from the very beginning, stated to the other two finalists that no matter what, they would be receiving a gift. So we had, um, I guess you could call them runner-up awards of $2,500 and $1,000. Um, the three finalists all had really unique and compelling, tangible things uh, they wanted to achieve with this grant. Um, and at the end of the day, the winner was the Muslim Women's Alliance, who received a $10,000 grant to launch a mentorship program for Muslim women who are survivors of domestic violence and provide career counseling for Muslim women and girls. So our goal going into this was to raise $15,000. And at the end of the day, we raised, including the match, $23,504 from 237 donors which um, the, the coolest part of it really was that 168 of the donors were completely new to CSW and really came from the social media outreach from the finalist grantees themselves as well as our, uh, our donors and our ambassadors and volunteers. So that is, in a nutshell, what we did. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. I think it's uh, really powerful the way that you brought together the best practices of crowdfunding and uh, really empowered your community in a lot of different ways. So what I'd love to do next is talk through some of those best practices and uh, refer back to what you did and share some examples uh, that I think might be really interesting for folks. So to that end, there are four key things that we have found help make a strong campaign and those are listed here. The first is an attainable goal. And what we mean by that is that it's important to share a goal that you think is possible to reach because people who donate want to feel like they are empowering you to do something that's realistic. So though it might seem like it makes sense to have a really lofty goal and go in with really big vision, certainly it's great to have um, an exciting initiative that you're doing make the campaign itself focused on a specific piece of that that is very attainable. And this really comes down to what we call the 30% rule, which means that uh, campaigns that reach 30% of their goal in the first couple of days after launch are much more likely to exceed their ultimate crowdfunding goal. So you actually want to hit that 30% very quickly on your campaign page so that then when people see your campaign after that, they perceive it as having the potential to be successful and something that they want to be part of. So in order to get from zero to 30, it's really important to line up your closest community, your closest um, people who you know who will be your donors so that you get there quickly. And you don't want it to be just from one person. So you don't want one major gift that gets you to 30%, but rather a significant number of volume um, of gifts in addition to a volume of dollars to hit that 30% quickly. And that is uh, very important to do quickly because then uh, what happens is lighter touch people start to see your campaign, which is great. You want people who find you via social media, you want people who find you via press to come to the page, but if they don't know you that well, then they really need to see that 30% in order to be excited to donate. And this image helps to make that uh, idea real for uh, you. If you look at both of these campaigns, they've raised $20,000 each, but one of them is on a much larger goal and therefore does not look as compelling because it's only at 13% compared with the campaign on the left side here, which is at 40%. So again, through the research we've done, we found it's about 30%. That's really the point at which people start to believe in your campaign and are more likely to donate if they're new to it. So getting to that 30% quickly is so key. So the next piece is your compelling pitch. And when we say pitch, we're really thinking about your overall frame of your ask, as well as the video content and your uh, written content. So starting out, you want to make your ask as specific as possible. I love how um, the Chicago Foundation for Women asked a very specific prompt. They said, what will you do with a gift of $10,000? And the answers from the applicants were very specific. These uh, 
particular examples on the page are from the three finalists that they had. Um, and you can see why these particular um, examples might have resonated with those who chose them because they are so specific and really help anybody who is considering making gift understand where their dollars will go. Now I know this can be challenging and it is often um, not something that you want to be 100% specific on, but you can even be generally as clear as you can. So you might share, we're trying to raise $50,000, which is about how much it helps it costs us to support um, an organization in a specific space for a year. So maybe you can not say exactly the activities they will do. The more specific you can be, the better. But even if you have to go a level up, having some level of specificity is uh, helpful. But again, the more specific, the better. A lot of these examples, you're even seeing specific numbers of um, women who would be supported by different amounts of dollars. And you can be prepared to have what we call stretch goals. So it might be that you raise that $10,000 very quickly. And then you want to be prepared to say, with additional funding, what additional work you can do. Because people do not stop giving just because you've hit 100%. In fact, that often is a chance to raise much more than your initial goal. I've seen campaigns have up to six stretch goals on their page as they iteratively hit more um, amounts of funding and then release an announcement about what they would do with even more funds. With respect to your video, you want to take that frame for what you want to do and um, what it will take to do that and really share that in the first 30 seconds of your video. You want to let people know what you're doing, what, how much you need for it, and also really share why people should care about it. So that first 30 seconds of your video is absolutely key. Many people will not watch more than 30 seconds and will choose to either donate or leave the page at that point. So the whole uh, summary of your initiative should be uh, complete in the first 30 seconds. Beyond that, you can go into more detail, sharing examples of what you've done in the past that makes you able to achieve what you want to do in the future, um, sharing stories of beneficiaries, <coughs> excuse me, um, sharing why you care about this. It is very important to make it personal. <coughs> so you do want to share a personal story there. And I find that there are a few levels of personal story that you can share. Your own, why are you taking the time to be part of this initiative? Why have you dedicated your career, perhaps, to doing this? Why do you care? Also, the story of um, a beneficiary. So why, how, how has it helped them in having their story come through? And then a story of a donor who has been part of your organization or who is um, likely to resonate with the potential donors you're looking to source. So those levels of story are so important because people give to people, first and foremost. Now, all in, you want to keep the whole video under three minutes because uh, people really won't, won't watch more than that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a fancy video. We find that it can be a very, um, it can be a very homemade video. That's great. People actually really resonate with authenticity on that. So uh, it doesn't need to be something that you've paid a lot for necessarily. And maybe somebody can help you do it pro bono or low bono, or you just do it on your phone. And that can be fantastic. Um, it really does need to be personal and authentic. And, um, that's what's most important. Now, I love what the Chicago Foundation for Women did in encouraging their community to create their video. This written description on the bottom shares um, a little bit of information on how to make a great video. And again, they share, uh, choose a spokesperson, make it um, somebody who will share that personal story. Doesn't need to be a very high quality video, just needs to be um, you telling your story in a concise way. So really nice that they empowered their community to make a strong video by giving them uh, quite, simple instructions that uh, sound like it was very effective. In terms of your write-up, this is how you share the story on the page. Now we have found that some people who come to your page will watch the video, others will read the text. So you actually need to share pretty much the same story but in written form that you share in your video. So again, it needs to be uh, very concise and engaging and personal and have those stories come through. I often see people on the page share their version of what they're doing in the less personal way than the video. So rather than saying, I care about this and um, I want to do this and we are looking to do that, they'll say, put it in the third person voice. That's not as effective as really keeping it personal and sharing why you are doing this and uh, getting those personal stories to come through, sharing images of who you are, of who the organization's leaders are. All of that's really key. Um, again, having that key information at the top of your page so that you have your summary info right at the top 
is key, just like people won't necessarily watch more than 30 seconds, many people won't scroll down your page before deciding whether to donate, so having that key info right at the top is very important. Another thing that is important is sharing your information visually. People really like to see infographics, um, often more so than they like to read, and many people will just jump from infographic to infographic on the page. So the more you can communicate with images, the better. I often see infographics used for uh, things like sharing a budget, so a pie graph or a bar chart of where your funds raised will go is a great thing to share, an infographic of your impact, and maybe this is something you update as the campaign goes on, and as you are able to achieve more impact, you fill out your image uh, to show that, uh, to correlate with the funds that you have raised. So a lot of things you can do with your page. Um, again, it's just really good to be authentic and transparent and personal there. This is another area where Maybe you can get somebody, if you don't have it on staff, to help you in a pro bono or low bono way. People who are good at infographics, people who are good at writing, those are some nice skills to have. Uh, as a side note, we actually, I recently did a webinar with the Taproot Foundation, and they have the Taproot Plus site that enables you to source uh, skilled volunteers to help in initiatives. And um, I think that that could be a really interesting place to get a skilled volunteer to help you with your graphic design, if that's something that you don't have in-house. Um, as well as maybe other things like the video making or social media, you could have different uh, volunteers help in different ways. So that's um, just a resource to remember. In addition to the pitch, the next thing that we like to share is the value of having unique perks. Now, every uh, fundraiser, every campaign on Indiegogo, uh, at least on our main site, is donation based, meaning that it is a uh, contribution. So the perks are simply tokens of thanks that you offer to your donors in exchange for their gift. Now, certainly you don't need to have them, but campaigns with perks raise far more than those without, and they are um, really great a place to engage your community and uh, excite them about donating. They do not necessarily need to be tangible, and you can be really creative with them. In terms of starting to think through your perks, a, a great thing to know is why people give, why do people um, donate. And what we find is that perks are a really great way to motivate your backers to give out of the three um, key reasons why, why people donate um, in addition to getting something. So that's the passion. People really care about um, a purpose and they want to move it forward. Pride. People like to be part of something bigger than themselves and then the participation itself. So they like to be uh, included in an initiative, they like to move it forward. So uh, we find that if you think through these different reasons why people give, you can be really creative in creating those perks. I love this image on the right hand side. This is for the Mission Cheese Shop, which is a cheese shop in the Bay Area. They raised funds on Indiegogo to launch the shop and one of the things that they offered their backers was to have their name on the wall of their shop. So if you look carefully at these fun sheep they have on the wall, their fur is actually made up of names of their Indiegogo backers. So it's just a really creative way to engage uh, their backers in being part of something that's going to be on their wall for, for you know forever, as long as they're there. So that's a really neat one. A few more examples to share on this page. You can be really creative with the perks, as I mentioned. Just having impact units is an important thing to have because some people want to give to your campaign and know that as much of their donation as possible is going straight to you and your work and your impact. So sharing something like $100 covers the cost of a participant in our programming for a week is a great thing to do as people understand uh, the impact that they're enabling and they might not need anything else um, other than that. Physical items are great if you can offer them. Of course, you do want to think through shipping those items and make sure that you're not burdening yourself too much. I love uh, the physical items that are very simple to receive but that are very um, meaningful to your campaign. So for example, the $50 perk on this page, the thank you card and seeds, was for a campaigner who is planting orchards at schools. And the idea of receiving seeds from them makes you feel really connected because you know that their organization is planting seeds and you're having the chance to be part of their programming and their work by having your own seeds. So it's just a really uh, quite simple thing for them to provide, but very special. Thank you cards are great if you can have your beneficiaries write cards, if you have uh, imagery of your beneficiaries or their work that you could provide as postcards or as um, digital images for the background of their phone, things like that can be great. 
this digital reward is a great one to think about because digital uh, perks are so much easier to provide. So uh, on, on this page, you're seeing digital access to readings. If you have, this is from that service year campaign that I mentioned. So here you could access the readings that the service year um, fellow gets. So that's a really nice uh, perk that's easy for them to provide. They have this content that make you feel connected to it. Um, experiences can be good. That is something that uh, you want to be thoughtful about because it's hard to know that your backer will necessarily be able to attend a specific time or date or location of an event. But nonetheless, um, they can be good, like offering a VIP cocktail um, reception for major donors or offering a uh, chance to join a webinar with your executive director or an influencer in your topic area. Those can be really fun types of things to offer. Um, if you have some companies that want to offer products to you that you'll share on your page, that can be good. The bottom right corner here is a clothing company that provided gift certificates to a campaign in the impact space. Um, especially if you are willing to share a little bit of information about that company, maybe you post an update to your campaign that uh, tells more about them and you post their logo on your campaign. Many companies are very open to helping campaigners in this way. They like the exposure that it gives them. They like supporting your organization um, in this way. So that can be something um, to look into. So yeah, the more you uh, think about what you have to offer and then you push yourself to be a little more creative and think through some ideas that might seem wacky, I think that's great. You can start with a diverse array of perks on your page and then see which ones are working and take down ones that are not and put up more of the type that are. Um, and over time, you'll find that uh, you, you can really figure out what resonates with your community. So uh, the last section is the proactive outreach section. And this is where we think through your promotion plan. It's a very important section. We sometimes say that your content and your promotion should each be about 50% of your focus as you prepare your campaign. This is because uh, the promotion plan is as important as your content in having success. So you want to really think through the many ways that you can reach your community, uh, starting with in-person conversations, telephone, email, um, and then moving to the lighter touch ways you reach people like social media and then engaging with your uh, campaign via updates and activating the press, activating, activating influencers, and uh, possibly even holding events. So thinking now through that whole process is going to be very helpful for you to have a successful initiative. The in-person part is where you'd likely talk with your closest community members to do things like source the matching gifts. So it was fantastic that the Chicago Foundation for Women had their board members commit to matching gifts up to, I believe it was 12K. This is a really wonderful way to show that the board is behind this initiative. And if you can do something similar, that's really powerful. Ideally, you would have seed and incentive donors to roll out throughout the fundraiser. So you'd have perhaps a large donation or two from a major donor early on in your campaign. And then a week or two later, you'd announce an incentive gift that says something like, if we raise 10K by the end of the week, then our donor will give 10K to the campaign. Um, and you might have even a couple of those that you can announce. And then what you want to do is make sure that you have that uh, full community excited before you go live. So you can actually send an email to your whole community right before you go live up to a week ahead to let them know that you're about to launch and to get excited and watch for your email announcing the campaign. So you don't want the first time you let them know about the campaign to be the ask. It's nice to tease it a little bit and get them excited ahead of time. Then when you go live, you do want to use email uh, first and foremost because we find email converts far better than any other source of communication. Uh, so making sure that you share your um, announcement via email is, is key and the more personalized it can be the better. So perhaps you have a smaller number of your bigger donors who you reach out to with a very personal approach and then have uh, perhaps slightly less tailored uh, outreach for lighter touch uh, folks in your network. I think that the way the Chicago Foundation for Women shares uh, the importance of email is fantastic and actually what they did for their grantees was to provide a sample email template so that they actually had, or for their potential grantees in their initiative, they had that email template to use that announced the stage they were at in the initiative and the potential to raise funds and um, how important it was to get uh, their votes via the donations so that they could uh, possibly unlock these bigger gifts. So, really important to have email, really neat that you can empower your 
portfolio or potential portfolio by providing an email template even that they can use. After email, we find that Facebook tends to be the second most valuable way to communicate. And uh, that is a great thing to empower folks to do too. So you want to be ready to use Facebook. And um, the more you could build your Facebook community ahead of time, the better. I would say if you don't have a Facebook community, don't necessarily create a new one for a campaign, but rather think through what are the social networks that work for you. Um, sometimes I see LinkedIn more powerful. Twitter I see sometimes uh, helpful, but it's, it's often the case that messages on Twitter go by so quickly that it doesn't always uh, have the full power that um, one might hope. So just think through where your community is. Um, but if it is on Facebook, that's fantastic, and I would really uh, focus on that. And I would make sure to have some really interesting content. So you don't want to feel like the content is spammy, but the more you can have really interesting content that you share, the better. So personal stories are great. Impact stories are great. Uh, face uh, fundraiser status updates are wonderful, like sharing, we've raised 50% of our goal, help us celebrate um, by posting this on Facebook. Those kinds of things are good to do. Um, it's also a wonderful place to post incentive donations. So um, on your Indiegogo page, you can have, uh, you can post what we call updates. And these are messages that will go via email to your backers, but they're also things that you can share on your social media stream. So they're a really good place to share this kind of uh, content. So I think the example that the Chicago Foundation for Women had is a fantastic one where they had a, so, a sample social media post that they shared with their finalists um, that they could, sh could share uh, with their community. So it's great to empower, again, your portfolio with these kind of uh, prompts. It makes it very easy for them to get the word out, and that can be very, very effective. And this is an example of two different kinds of uh, post. So the first one is a sample tweet or, or a sample um, Facebook or, or tweet where they're sharing about the chance to receive $10,000. It's really exciting for an organization to share. And then the second one is sharing uh, the, just a mention of the staff and board of directors um, pledging their $12,000 here. So the double the impact message is a great one too. So having these updates, uh, you really want to post them at least a couple times a week so that you are engaged in your community and empowering them to share with their community so that you're getting that flywheel effect of reaching many people. Ultimately, um, it's great to rally even broader audiences than um, your close community, and this can happen on Indiegogo itself. The platform on Indiegogo has something we call the GoGo -Go factor uh, for every campaign, meaning that every campaign is uh, tracked for how much social engagement it is having. So the more people are coming to the campaign and the more they are sharing it, um, and the more percent of the goal that has been raised, things like this are part of the go-go factor. And the more the go-go factor goes up, the higher the campaign will rise up uh, for our marketing team to see and hopefully uh, notice and then share via places like social media or our newsletter. Um, and the more it rises up on its own page on the site, things like that. We also find that industry and local press are uh, interested in campaigns, especially if they've gotten initial momentum. So a nice thing to do there is to reach out to industry influencers or press ahead of your campaign to let them know it's coming, maybe even ask for their advice, and then not usually uh, share the campaign with them on day one because they don't often find it compelling enough to write about or share until it has momentum, but maybe once you've raised about 50% of your goal, go back to them and share any um, exciting updates that you have uh, with them and see if they'll share at that point. And that is something that we can see be very powerful if you've developed a relationship already. So I would think through topic area influencers, geographic influencers, um, and also really think about Facebook groups of people who should know what you're doing and who would be likely to care about it and get to know those Facebook, Facebook group organizers ahead of time. Um, those are all the types of folks to, to cultivate. Um, YouTube YouTubers are really good at driving an audience to a, a website, so they're great to get to know. Um, all of those kinds of folks. Then, of course, um, offline groups can be good, too. So it might make sense to share your campaign in a local meeting if you have um, a neighborhood organization, if you have an alumni group of people who would care about you. Maybe you have portfolio alumni who would support a current grantee. Um, all this kind of outreach can be great to think through ahead of time so you cultivate those relationships to activate once you're live. So those are the main tips for running great campaigns. Now uh, let's take a couple quick minutes to talk about how to tailor that for Giving Tuesday, and then we can move um, quickly into questions. 
So Giving Tuesday, uh, I think probably folks are pretty aware, is a day, um, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, to activate uh, the world to do something good to kick off the holiday season. It was founded back in 2012 um, by the 92nd Street Y in New York and has quickly grown to be quite a global movement with um, m many uh, mentions on social media and many donations coming in to support a variety of organizations on this day. Crowdfunding has become a big piece of it because funding is often the key ask that organizations make on Giving Tuesday and many people are open to making a gift at that time. So how can we make Giving Tuesday work well as an organization in crowdfunding? Well, certainly knowing the general, general tips is great. Well, a lot of what I covered today uh, are those kinds of tips. There are a lot more examples in our nonprofit guide, which you can download at this site for free. So download that to get um, even more advice. Then create a draft campaign and send it to me on Indiegogo. We will be um, collecting fundraisers, participating in Giving Tuesday um, that we know about and have worked with into a collection, as we call it. So it's an extra place on Indiegogo that will likely uh, promote in a few different places. So uh, actually, if you have a campaign on Indiegogo or on Generosity, we can include it in there. So make sure to send that to me, um, I, again, ideally by November 3rd, because uh, we need to get that all set up in place on our side. It can just be a draft. You don't need to go live until later. But uh, if you are planning to be live on Giving Tuesday and have a draft that you can share by November 3rd, um, do that so I can get it included. And then for launching, we find that it's actually important to launch earlier than Giving Tuesday. So you want to be live the week of November 13th, ideally, to raise a third of your goal before Thanksgiving week. We find that when people are over holidays, it's a very hard time to fundraise on crowdfunding because people are not at their computers. So the week of Thanksgiving is a tough one to make an ask. So we find you really need to raise about 30% of your goal, 30 to 50% in the week before Thanksgiving. So this year, that's the week of November 13th. So get your campaign live then, get your closest community in the door, get um, a volume of donors into your campaign so that then on Giving Tuesday, you are using that day not as a day to go from zero to 30%, which you could do ahead of time, but rather to go from 30% to a broader network and get those lighter touch people to see your page who need to already have seen that 30% momentum ahead of donating. So you wanna be at that point on Giving Tuesday, a great day to launch a specific initiative. So on your campaign, announce a new incentive gift from a donor, announce a new uh, perk or create a secret perk as we call it, which you can share via special URL with only people who see that URL will see the perk. Um, you could have a stretch goal that you announce that day. It could be a goal for just the day. I find that having a goal that um, extends at least a week is, is better. Maybe you kick it off on Giving Tuesday, but you have a whole week um, in order to get the momentum you're trying to reach with that initiative since one day is, um, of course, very, very fast. Um, so yeah, you want to go live big on Giving Tuesday, post an update to your campaign with um, template social media posts that your community who sees that update can just copy and paste into social media and uh, really engage for Giving Tuesday. And then once that day is over, make sure to circle back and thank your community for supporting you and activate their continued support through the end of the year. And um, just real quick, I, I was um, wanting to make sure to share with you ways that you can support your grantees. So maybe you want to run a campaign for your organization and foundation, or maybe you want to run a campaign to amplify one of your gifts or more of your gifts, or maybe you just want to share education and empowerment with your portfolio to run their own campaigns. Here are some um, things to think about for any or all of those scenarios. So. Creating a, a video for your campaigners, I often find that organizations find this challenging. It sounds like maybe um, that's changing um, given the success of the Chicago Foundation for Women. I think that's awesome. Um, but if you have any kind of resources or advice um, that you could offer to campaigners for creating their video, I think that's a place that at least they are sometimes intimidated, if not facing challenges. And what I find is that the video needs to be very specific for the campaign. It does not work to repurpose a video that they have used for a gala or something else because people who are donating on a campaign want to feel like they are part of something very special and uh, the video needs to reflect that. Perks, um, it's often the case that 
organizations would love to have more perks to offer. So if you have things that you could let your grantees use as perks, that's a great thing to do. Maybe you have access to uh, baseball tickets at your local stadium that you could offer or the chance to have lunch with a local influencer um, and you ask your network to if somebody would be willing to do that who you knew who know who would be exciting um, maybe a local sports person maybe a local politician um, different kinds of folks like that um, again you can be creative think through what assets you have at your foundation and which ones might appeal to donors and um, then offer those to your grantees to use to source those gifts um, seed matching and incentive gifts, we've talked about that a little bit, but um, if you can offer those to your campaigners, that um, can be really powerful, um, ideally with a testimonial about why you have supported them. The fact that you as a foundation have selected those grantees shows your diligence, and that is a powerful message to send to somebody who maybe hasn't had the time to do that diligence, but trusts your perspective. Template content, we've talked about some of these templates um, that you can share, those are fantastic. Particularly email and Facebook um, templates are great. And then sharing their campaigns, so who can you share their campaign with? What influencers do you know who might be willing to share with their community? Um, well, who in the press might be willing to cover it? And who do you know who might be a direct donor? So these are just some ways that you, uh, you can support your grantees. And with that, I will, um, pause and I think it's a great time to move to questions for me or for Emily. Yeah, thank you so much Brie and Emily for sharing your knowledge. Um, I want to open the floor up to our attendees. You can either raise your hand and I can unmute you um, in the uh, control panel or you can feel free to submit questions in the question box. If there's no question, I might throw one out for Emily. I was um, wondering, what was it like at your organization, at your foundation, to uh, run this initiative? Like, how um, hard was it to get people to agree to do it? And did you have any tips or tricks for how to manage it successfully, uh, things like that? Sure. So <clears throat> it was, I think, a little daunting just because we had never done anything like this before. and. Um, we really haven't um, been raising a significant amount of money online that just traditionally hasn't been where CFW's revenue has come from. So in that regard, it was a little nerve wracking just because it was such a new uh, territory for us. I think engaging our board early on, I think as Bree mentioned, kind of getting that core group um, really on board and excited about the initiative before it was uh, publicly known was really key. Um, and then also having the staff, uh, all of the staff, you know, involved, not just the development staff, but having our program staff and admin staff, sort of everyone um, taking some ownership over spreading the news and, and getting the word out. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the grantees, I think, you know, they all um, pushed it at different, um, in different amounts, but I would definitely say that mo one of the reasons Muslim Women's Alliance won is because they were out actively asking their networks to to participate and to give. Um, and so, you know, we had lots of small dollar donations from um, the Muslim community, um, which was really cool and just really um, awesome. It also came at a particular time, uh, right after the election, the 2016 elections, and um, right around the travel ban, the first travel ban. So there was a lot of um, passion for supporting um, Muslim, uh, Muslim women in Chicago at that time. So it was just um, something that was on top of mind for people. To, to follow up on that a little bit, um, uh, Bree, I did, I had a question because Emily, when you're talking about sort of a rapid response, essentially, like when something is coinciding with a political, you know, event or something that's happening in the broader society, how does that work with, with crowd, crowdfunding from your perspective, Bree? Um, if something happens and it sort of, you know, there's an urgency around raising money quickly, how is it, how, what are sort of, you know, how do best practices lend themselves to that kind of situation? Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, I think there's tremendous opportunity to raise funds in a situation like that. If you are an organization that has a unique perspective and ability to make impact in an area, then there is a big demand by backers to do something, but they often don't know what to do because they aren't experts in the particular topic area. So the more that you can 
act fast and be the one that they hear about and are doing good work in the space, the better. So I do think that speed is pretty darn important in that case. So especially if you imagine there might be something like that coming up in the future, I think getting that buy-in from your board and a team early and ahead of the time can be good. So say, hey, we don't know if this is going to be an opportunity, but should the case arise where we can make a campaign to address a topic that it becomes very timely, we want to be able to go live quickly. Do you approve us having a matching gift amount from the board or something like that? And do you approve uh, this general copy that we will tailor to this specific situation? So the more you can be ready, the better. And then getting that word out, Again, uh, I think starting with email is still good to so get that closest community momentum going, but then I do think going to press quite quickly after you have some initial momentum is good because the press is often open to including fundraisers. Um, at this point, they've become aware of it, but you want to be that fundraiser that they catch. So I think there's a big opportunity in, in spaces like that. I mean, we have right now a, I want to say, $1.6 million campaign for recovery in Puerto Rico on generosity, and uh, that one was one that came got up quite quickly and um, has become a real place for uh, support. So I see one question. Thank you for answering that question, Bree. Um, I see one question from the Women's Fund of Central Ohio. I, I don't think the question came through, but um, Olivia Johnson, do you want do you have do you have something you wanted to ask? I've unmuted you, so. You should be able to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. She didn't have a question. I think it was a mistake typing it through. Um, okay. Well, I, I think on, we have about two minutes left to go. And I, um, unless there's anything, Bree or Emily, that you want to add before we wrap up, um, I don't want to go over. So. No, I'm great. Thank you so much for, for having us. Yeah, thank you so much for um, sharing your, your insights um, with our community. And um, I hope that folks will submit their feedback on this session and let us know um, both how, how this sort of met your needs as well as if you have additional questions or suggestions for additional experts that we can bring in for future webinars. Um, we'll be sending around uh, the materials from this from this call, so the, the full um, deck that Bree uh, presented, um, as well as I'm hopeful we can submit, we can we can share some of the case study in a written form that Emily presented, um, and then the recording for this for this call. Um, otherwise, I think I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for attending, and thanks Bree and Emily. Thanks so much for your contribution. Thank you for organizing. Bye for now. Okay. Bye.